Hey guys, this is Cobain. Today, what I want to talk about is the theology of the image and likeness of God uh, and how the language and concept undergirding the idea of the distinction between the image and the likeness is rooted in Scripture, how we relate it to Scripture. Now, the distinction between the image and likeness of God is often associated with Irenaeus, and the image is well, strictly speaking, the image is Christ himself, because Christ is the image of God. We are made in the image of God. But the image is that which man possesses by his creation. It is that likeness which is inbuilt. It is that likeness which is the imprint of the divine archetype. Um, now, the likeness is that which is attained. Now, the character of the likeness owes its quality to the nature of the image. But it is not the same thing as the image according to this way of speaking. The image is that which is already possessed simply by virtue of being a human being. The likeness is that which is acquired. It is a resemblance to and union with God that is had by virtue of the free cooperation of the will by the power of the Holy Spirit in the uncreated life of God, such that one not only acquires qualities which are similar to or imprints of divine qualities, but one acquires the divine qualities themselves as constitutive of one's mature personal identity by the power of God who lives and moves in us. Now, the challenge for this, if one is committed to saying, okay, the fathers of the church are not just using biblical language as a kind of oil paint to make something else, but you no, know, scripture and tradition actually has an inner unity such that each of them interpreted on their own terms in principle coheres with the other. Problem is that the words image and likeness seem to be used in an inconsistent way, a way which suggests, at least at first glance, that they're being used effectively as synonyms. Uh, for example, in Genesis uh, chapter 1, we are told, or God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. But then in Genesis 5, we're told that God created man in the likeness of God, and then when Adam's fathering of Seth is described, the order of these two nouns is inverted. So Adam fathers a son in his own likeness according to his image. And so the question that I want to put to you and that I put to myself, and I think I have a good answer to it, which is why I'm making this video, is, is there any principle which consistently governs the usage of these words that corresponds to the theological distinction being made in the tradition. Now, to begin with, there's absolutely no question that Scripture teaches that man was created in spiritual childhood and was developed through time. The foundation of this is, of course, Genesis 1 to 3. God created the heavens and the earth, that he created these two spheres of reality, the one being his throne room with myriads and myriads of heavenly hosts, a world which didn't develop or mature or change. The angels don't reproduce, they're created as a host. And the other, the earth being a formless void and dark mass of water, the primordial element, which is shaped and molded and brightened over the six-day creation by the hand of God, so that it increasingly resembles its heavenly, and through that heavenly, divine archetype. Ultimately, heaven and earth are to be joined together in mutual indwelling, so that each of them, while not being assimilated into the other, fully permeates the other sphere. Genesis 1 begins with the dyad of heaven and earth and ends in terms of the last thing that is created with the dyad of male and female. So that first correspondence anticipates the great correspondence as there is a dyad of heaven, earth matching male, female, and male, female to be one flesh. Well, at the end of the whole Bible, 
not just the end of the chapter, not just the end of the creation week narrative. In the whole Bible, heaven and earth themselves are married. This is the marriage supper of the Lamb, where the uh, seer John beholds the city of God descending from heaven and filling all creation. That city is, in fact, an architectural holy mountain. The dimensions correspond to a pyramid. It could correspond to a cube, but we know it's a pyramid because the river is flowing downwards. So that gives preference to the pyramid. So we know from uh, Genesis 1 and the whole Bible that there's this heaven and earth dyad. Moreover, we know Genesis 2, verse uh, 4 and 5, that man is the offspring of heaven and earth. So the creation of man, this is a zooming in to the... Uh, sixth day of creation and actually there are a number of literary correspondences between genesis 2 and 3 and the creation week um underscoring the fact that these are really uh quite intimately integrated texts and the whole source critical thing is just a bunch of nonsense nevertheless it's clear that there's a literary distinction here we're beginning another section in genesis uh, 2 4 and one of the first clues that there is a correspondence in fact the uh, conceptual map of the creation week is recapitulated and thus commented on in order in Genesis chapter 2. I've talked about this in my blog, uh, but it begins in a very similar way to Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, now God creates man who is the generations of or the offspring of, the son of the heavens and the earth. That phrase generations of, is every time that is it is used throughout the Bible, it refers to offspring the only usage which is possibly ambiguous is this one and so we should interpret this in light of all the other texts so what does it mean to say man is the offspring of heaven and earth well we are shown that he is begotten by the spirit of god or the breath of life and the dust of the ground the ground is adama that is feminine and then god is the active partner he is the one who moves in relation to the world he initiates the relationship and he constitutes the earth as a partner to himself. Now, God being God eternally begets the Son as the Logos through whom he knows himself as perfect love from eternity. And so to be, make the creation a true partner, to make the earth a real dialogue partner, he has to make the earth able to speak. And so he gives the earth the ability to speak. And you and I are talking earth. That's not a poetic device. That is literally what we are. We are made up of the stuff of creation. And we are integrated in terms of a higher order principle. Such that all of these molecules and atoms and, um, and cells and bacteria, which could in principle be doing their own thing. Now they're integrated in terms of a common and unifying purpose, and we can speak. We can talk to God. We are talking earth. Now God has a real dialogue partner because dialogue is the mode of communion. Notice that whenever you speak, you are sending forth words, but you cannot send forth the words without also sending forth breath. So God always speaks in the spirit. Okay, this, is, this is not a coincidence. This is not a analogy. It is a homology. God created the world as a parable or reflection of his own divine life. So God creates the heavens and the earth. Now man is the generations of the heavens and the earth. He's the stitch which binds the two together. And we get this idea very quickly that man is to develop over time. Man is naked. Okay, now, nakedness is not the state to which we will return in the world to come. And most clothes in the book of Genesis don't signify sin. For example, Joseph is exalted and vested with a robe of glory and beauty, a rainbow robe one might say, and then Pharaoh gives him a robe of authority. It represents authority and dominion. It represents a position and an office. It represents a relationship to the father figure in whose name one exercises dominion. 
Joseph has that rainbow robe because he is speaking with Jacob's voice, and he has the royal robe in Egypt because he speaks with the voice of Pharaoh. And so clothing indicates a union which means that one is able to speak on behalf of the other because the other is actually speaking through the one. This is a really important point. That's why we see in Ezekiel 16, God describes his initial marriage of Israel as his putting his wing, that is the tassel which was attached to his clothing, his garment of glory. He put his wing over Israel. Male and female, bridegroom and bride, in a symbolic way, share a single set of clothing. We also get the idea that Adam and Eve and mankind is meant to develop spiritually when God brings Adam all of the birds and beasts. And what does he say? He asks Adam to give them names. Well, the name of a thing, according to biblical and really most traditional understandings, the name uh, signifies and expresses the inner quality of a thing. How do you know that a box is a box? Well, because it has the qualities which pertain uniquely to the nature of a box, that which sets the box uh, apart from every other category in existence. And the name corresponds in some way to these qualities. Now, the nature of that correspondence is beyond the scope of this video, but I do not believe that it's simply arbitrary. And there are a good number of fascinating features in the Hebrew and other languages indicating that we are dealing on not with an arbitrary set of signs, but actually with a window in itself into a much deeper vision of the way that the world is integrated as a single revelation um, of the one God. But let's remember, God creates the plants and he creates animals what does he do with adam well he creates adam adam's the first thing created in this uh in, in the narrative of genesis 2 and 3 remember from a literary point of view it is meant to recapitulate the creation days of genesis chapter 1 because obviously moses is writing after all of this done so that moses is showing the way in which man spiritually embodies the qualities which are distributed throughout the whole cosmos so god creates man and then he plants the garden before his eyes. Adam watches God planting a garden. And then God brings the animals to Adam, and Adam is meant to give them the appropriate name. And it is only after giving them the appropriate names that he is able to discern that none of them are a suitable helpmate or partner for him in this work of creatively developing the world as God's arm as God's instrument and partner. And so God knew what Adam needed, but the reality is that Adam was only prepared to receive what he needed to receive when he understood why, when he understood the nature of the task which was being set before him. He asked God, God put him into a deep sleep, that's a death symbol then he joins him back together division reunification obviously this has very significant biblical implications god splits water from water and in the end the world to come he removes the heavenly sea so that god will be all in all heaven and earth will be totally reunited that's what all these uh, divisions and reunifications are all about um in any case the way that this happens is through speech it's through language it's through specifically naming and you will notice that in the narrative of King Solomon, this is a recapitulation of the Adam story. Solomon is a royal figure who's given dominion over a portion of God's creation. Uh, and he imports animals from the ends of the earth. He studies the beasts and he writes a book of Proverbs. And in the Proverbs, there are lots and lots of parables illustrating the ways of the animals. This word is usually the same word as way of the Lord or walk in my way, prepare the way of the Lord. That is, it is the way in which God himself exists. This is the way in which God is. It's his way of being God. And he imprints himself in a variety of ways, illustrating various of his qualities in specific animals. 
And by looking at the animals both in themselves and in relation to each other, we are able to identify their ways and we learn something about God, about ourselves, and about his creative purpose in the world. Solomon studies the beasts, then he sees, uh, then the Queen of Sheba comes to him corresponding to Eve coming to Adam, and the Queen of Sheba puts a series of riddles, political questions uh, to him. But the point here is that the analysis of the animals is not just a, you know, a pedantic fact that, oh, Adam gave names to the animals. No, it does have this deeper significance, which is uh, inherent to the very concept of, of giving a thing a name. And we can see that in the way that this text is used by later uh, biblical authors and understood by later biblical authors. Now, I just want you to pay very close attention to and remember the centrality of the idea of naming, because I haven't forgotten our, that this video is about the distinction and relationship between the image and likeness of God. In fact, the idea of naming is going to be incredibly central to this, and I'm, I really haven't gone off track from what I wanted to do. I want also you to note that uh, Genesis 2 ends with Adam and Eve being naked and not ashamed. And then we are told that the serpent or the nakash is craftier than all the other creatures. Now, actually, the way that this text is written, it can be interpreted just as easily as referring to the nakash, uh, usually rendered serpent, as the steward of all the other beasts. That he's not one of the beasts, but he's above all of them. He's craftier than all of them. It can also be read as uh, seeing, uh, referring to him as the preeminent of the beast. Now, this is because he's an angelic figure. As we've talked about before, the words for serpents are closely associated with angels. Okay, seraphim, you see in Isaiah 6, these are clearly angels, they're in the heavenly council, and yet the word means serpent. In Numbers chapter 14, we see both the words nachash and seraph, and they're used together to refer to flying serpents, which it's not clear whether they're angels or serpents or whatever. We also see in the four faces of the cherubim that three of those four faces are animal faces. So there's already an association between the kind of existence that animals have and the kind of existence that angels have. And I think the reason for this, it's really a topic for another video, but the reason for it is that animals signify this or that particular quality of God, right? So a human being is the summation and the imprint of the entire logos. He's a microcosm, he or she is a microcosm of the entire creation. The whole range of qualities and perfections is present in one way or another in the human being. And an animal, however, one specific quality or set of qualities seems to be accentuated. One can look at the kindness and love of a dog and derive genuine lessons about the life of God and the kind of God that he is. But if one only looked at the dog, one would not derive an accurate picture because it's not been contextualized in light of everything else. Well, likewise, angels are species unique. Okay? So angels don't have uh, a common nature. Every angel has its own distinctive nature. And the reason that they've been called, for example, by, uh, by some of the scholastics, pure form is because they are uh, created to contemplate a very specific perfection in the divine mind. So every one of us has a guardian angel. They've been created just for us. I mean, the, the, the number of angels is extraordinary, but we have to remember that uh, angels are not like us in all sorts of ways that we don't usually take into account. But I think the specificity of the natures of the angels is what links them to animals. In any case, that's the reason I believe that there is a ambiguity or middle way between the serpentine and angelic understanding of this text because angels are linked with serpents. Well, Lakash... Uh, uh, taken as a substantive adjective, means bright one. That's why Isaiah 14, we are told that he is the uh, son of the morning. Okay, He's the day star. He's identified there as the king of Babel or king of Babylon because Babel or Babylon signifies and sums up the whole system of rebellious creation. Because Babel, it is bound together on earth by blood. Nimrod is a mighty slaughterer before the Lord. But he also builds a tower up to heaven, attempts to seize a place in the heavenly court. And likewise, because man is the heir of the world, the rebellious members of the heavenly court are attempting to build their way downwards and utilize Nimrod's foolishness. I mean, he's a real Nimrod. I mean, that is providential justice, I believe. <laughs> Nimrod now means fool. Um, 
uh, they try to utilize that to inherit uh, the world. So, uh, all of that stuff is going on. What I wanted to uh, point you to here is that the Hebrew word for naked and the Hebrew word for crafty are nearly identical. They sound nearly identical. And we are to understand that there is a relationship between the two, and it is a pun of contrast. Adam and Eve are spiritual children, okay? They have not been clothed in glory and honor. They don't know how to shape and mold and remake the world. They're being fed directly from the breast of the earth. They're being fed directly from trees, which they had no role in planting or growing or taking care of, at least not yet. Uh, the bright one, the Nakash by contrast, he is described as crafty. He uh, is understood to have the keys to the world he knows how to run it he knows how to manage it that's why there's a there are traditions that before the flood high technology or relatively high technology developed because of the tutelage of these heavenly beings they were made as the tutors of uh, of mankind so that man would be guided and prepared to receive the keys of the kingdom when he was ready to inherit uh, his throne Notably, as James Jordan points out, and this isn't just, I think, a diabolical thing. Uh, various peoples around the world, how you, you know, there's all these poisonous plants, and it's very hard to distinguish poisonous plants from um, edible plants in, in many places. So, how was it first discovered? People assume it's just trial and error, but that would be pretty extraordinary. Um, there is, a, there are traditions around the world that the gods led this or that people group away from Babel or whatever they remembered Babel as. There is a very consistent widespread tradition of a central location, often a tower or tree, from which the nations scattered. Uh, how were they led to their homelands? Well, their patron deity or their god uh, or their angel led them there, and they were the ones who taught them which uh, plants were useful for medicine, which plants were deadly, and so on uh, and uh, so forth. Now we are uh, getting... <laughs> a little bit off track. Point is, the devil, we'll just call him Lucifer, that's not a personal name, it just is Latin um, uh, for, for uh, bright, uh, but Lucifer uh, was the chief steward of the creation prior to the catastrophe of the uh, fall. Now, I have suggested or argued that the actual moment of the devil's rebellion can be identified in Genesis 3, that the opening question in Genesis 3 is analogous to the kinds of questions that God puts to Job in uh, Job chapters 38 to 42. God says, tell me about this, tell me about that. Or when God says to Moses, I'm going to destroy the children of Abraham, what do you think about that? It is a slight misstatement that is designed to provoke a quotation and thus contemplation of the actual word of God. Now, you don't have to agree with me on that, but I think that is uh, what makes most sense just because uh, by the end of the sixth day, everything was still very good, and that includes the angelic host created on the first day. I think the fall is on the uh, Sabbath day. And then what is it that exactly provokes the rebellion of the devil? Well, he is going to have to hand over the keys to mankind. And the uh, a precondition of him handing over the keys is the successful development and tutelage of mankind so that man might be crowned with glory and honor, as Psalm 8 says, for a little while lower than the gods or lower than the angels, but then they shall be crowned with glory and honor. Now, when the devil asks, or when Lucifer asks Eve what the commandment is, she says that we shall not eat of the tree uh, for knowing good and evil, neither shall we touch it. Neither shall we touch it. Now that little phrase, neither shall we touch it, is not given in the original commandment, but it is a legitimate and, in fact, um, necessary inference. This is throughout the Levitical system. Those things which you can't eat are also unclean to touch. The spiritual and practical core of this is uh, if something is prohibited, you're not able to run your fingers over it in delight. If fornication is prohibited, well, don't uh, get naked with someone of the opposite sex and just stare at each other. If adultery is prohibited, don't flirt with other people for fun. 
that which is prohibited is also prohibited to the touch because the touch leads to um, the full embrace of the forbidden fruit. And so when the devil or Lucifer sees this is the beginning, God has created man as a single organism, the human family, which is a plural unity. So there's a male female dyad. God t told Adam the commandment directly. Eve didn't hear it. Genesis 2, Adam is the only one who's created when that commandment is given. The only word that's given them to them together is given to us in Genesis 1, 26 and following, where God says, uh, uh, you shall eat um, uh, every green plant and every fruit tree I give you for food. So she learned this commandment from Adam. And then she extends it. She develops it. She draws a rational conclusion from it. And it's that dialogue which creates a deepening of wisdom, which brings about a deepened capacity to exercise dominion over the world. And that is when he initiates his program of active deception because he wants to thwart the maturation and glorification of the human family because he resents his own creatively installed purpose, which is to prepare the human family for its glory and to rejoice with them as counselors in that glory. And remember, every creature has perfect joy in the fulfillment of its natural end. The setting aside of crowns by the angels is no uh, tragedy. It is the fulfillment of their natural end and their joy is in setting aside those crowns, the exaltation of the human family and brotherhood with the human family as counselors with us. Though mankind is the preeminent organism, the preeminent creature in the universe, more honorable than the cherubim, beyond compare, more glorious than the seraphim. A little while lower than the angels, crowned with glory and honor. So, the craftiness is the inverse of the nakedness. That is, if the nakedness represents spiritual childhood, the craftiness corresponds to a robe, which makes good sense. A robe is a sign of authority. A robe is a sign of glory. And a robe is a means of extension. And authority is about the capacity to effectively extend oneself causally in relation to other things. So that's why one robe uh, wraps two people. Or a robe... Uh, without tear signifies the unity of the church. Uh, the robe of the high priest signifies the integrated unity of all things. A mixed fabric was prohibited not because it was unclean, but because it was holy. Holiness indicates a higher degree of correspondence to the inner life of God. Holiness is dangerous to touch if you have not been adequately prepared. And a mixed fabric is holy. The high priest, in fact, his garment is just mixed fabric through and through. Every Israelite is to wear a blue tassel, which is a small mixed fabric. It represents their increased holiness, their consecration relative to the nations, their special priestly service for the world. But the high priest is holy from top to bottom. He represents and anticipates the incarnate logos and the mixture of the fabric signifies the integration and unification of all things in their natural end which is harmony the unification of male female heaven and earth israel and the nations god creation man god world so on and so forth that's why jesus's robe is such a point of emphasis in the gospel of john fun little tidbit here uh Jesus, uh, when, when Peter sees Jesus in John chapter 21, it says, it says he, um, he put on his robe, put on his garment, and then leapt into the water. And then he meets Jesus. Jesus does what he does. He had, they have the famous conversation, do you love me? Jesus then says, when you are old, someone else will dress you. Follow me. Because we are clothed in the garments of Jesus. And what does it mean to follow Jesus? Jesus, well, Jesus says, follow me in the context of describing Peter's martyrdom at the end of his life. That is what it means for Peter to follow Jesus. For the disciple whom Jesus loved, what about this man? And Jesus says, if I want him to live until I come, that has nothing to do with you. You follow me. I've told you how to follow me. Totally or mostly irrelevant uh, 
for the, the subject of this video, but I uh, couldn't resist mentioning it. So, um, in Genesis 3, when the our first parents are expelled from the garden, what is it that God said? He says, man has become as one of us, knowing good and evil. Now notice the first person plural here. This divine first person plural is not common. In fact, this is the second time it was used. The first time was in the creation of man, Genesis 126, 28. And what did God do there? God gave mankind dominion. He said, to go forth, subdue, conquer the world. Exercise authority in my behalf. The period of waiting, the prohibition on the tree of knowledge, this is simply the uh, blueprint for that program. This is how you exercise dominion. You have got to grow into it. When you acquire understanding of the world, then you will weave from that world garments of glory and beauty rather than the garments of death that uh, were brought upon them because of the fall. Behold, man has become as one of us. We see that the language of the heavenly council, the heavenly court, which exists in his throne room, which is the same thing as the celestial hierarchy known to the Dionysian tradition, the heavenly council, the heavenly court, it, it, it refers to man's purpose and destiny in relation to God as his vice regent. Now, the fact that we've got this thematic parallel here, the fact that we've got the linguistic parallel, and yet the two texts seemingly say such different things tells us it's being done intentionally. The whole point is that we are talking about the same thing that was being talked about in Genesis chapter 1 where man was created in the image of God and after his likeness. And now man is expelled. He's driven out of the Garden of Eden. Why? Because if one knows the wiring of the world if one is successfully able to exercise dominion over the world, but one is not committed to the divine intention for the world, one can be incredibly destructive. You might think of someone who understands the inner essences of all of the uh, creatures of the world, the, the logi of things, and uses them in a magical context to manipulate them for ends opposed to God. It's incredibly dangerous. God says in Genesis chapter 11, uh, when man is unified, nothing will be withheld from them, and so God splits them up. Well, the point is not that God somehow is has been outwitted or overpowered. It's that God's wired the world in such a way that the unity of mankind ontologically has the necessary consequence that their purposes will be realized in the world. And so he splits them up because the world is redeemed as what it is. He works within the laws that he has written. It's just as C.S. Lewis says, what we generally call the laws of nature are just lower order effects of the higher order laws. The, um, it's like the relationship of the conservation of angular momentum to gravity, right? So the conservation of angular momentum can be described in its own equations, um, but it's not something other than the other physical laws or the physical patterns. It is a lower order derivative of these higher order patterns in specific contexts. By the same token, it is God's own way of being, which is the real law of everything. That is what sets the boundaries for what it means for a thing to be. What we call the laws of nature, these are very, very, very lower order effects in very, very specific contexts. It's the tree of knowledge which grants wisdom to see the inner natures of things and consequently to provide the capacity to shape things according to that knowledge. This is one reason why the devil is dangerous. He is, uh, his original creative design was as chief tutor to mankind, teach man about the world. Well, the enemy has a good deal of knowledge about the world, about its workings, about its wiring. I have a um, I suspect, in fact, I more than suspect, I, I think I would say tentatively, but I would say I, I believe this to be true, that um, just as angels were set as the uh, administrators of the world in preparation for mankind, and just as mankind has the task to creatively develop the world, including you know, plants, including birds and beasts and so forth, 
Oh, what, what is it which explains the uh, widespread structures of predation in the animal world? Well, I suspect that the enemy, uh, utilizing his and his subordinates' positions of administration of the creation, um, has used that to guide the development of certain organisms, in particular directions, directions which mirror uh, their own predatory uh, behavior. The interesting thing is that if you look at these, uh, at, at the major predators, if you just look at their biological family, you will very often, in fact, you'll almost always find a relatively uh, a, a near biological relation, which is herbivorous. Or you will find such in the fossil record, in the relatively recent or fossil record, recent in terms of the physical size of the whole fossil record, not the textual dating. Um, we, we know of herbivorous um, crocodiles, for example. Okay, so that's, that's documented in the record. They're extinct now, but we know they existed. Um, we know of herbivorous bears. It's called a panda bear. Okay. Todd Wood has a really interesting example about a um, there's a species of beetle which is well known for um, just tearing apart forests and throwing the whole ecosystem out of balance. Well, Wood has provided a an argument that the original creation design is as a for forest management mechanism, and it has been taken and redirected in this twisted way so that it is destructive in the world and not productive, not creative in the world. So this is all about dominion, management, changing, shaping, molding the world. That's what it means to have dominion. To say that you own something means you have the capacity and the right to do with that thing what you wish to do with it. You can do what you want on your computer within certain limits. And so there are interconnected and interpenetrating structures of ownership. The whole society is a stake in your stuff because your actions affect others. And yet you are the preeminent in relation to your own property. Why bring this up in this context? Because it's all about inheritance. How does one extend one's d dominion, one's ownership of a given thing, a given piece of property to another subject? Well, the natural language for this is sonship. Israel is my son what God says in the book of Exodus. Israel is my son. The book of Exodus begins with Israel building uh, store cities for uh, uh, for Pharaoh and for his gods. Uh, they build uh, Piatum, Piton, the house of Atum. They end by building the house of the Lord, the tabernacle. They began by building cities for Pharaoh. They end by journeying towards the construction of the city of God. Israel is my son is the unifying principle of that. And what is it that gives Israel sonship meaning? Well, it is that God's name is made known to them. Remember, the name has to do with character because name signifies and expresses those qualities which mark a thing out as what it is. God's mode of existence, his pattern of being, his own presence is described in the language of the name. Exodus 33 to 34, God proclaims his name to Moses. It's a cloud of glory which passes before him. And God says, I will make my goodness known to you. I consider in that light Genesis chapter 1 where God names the various creatures and then identifies them as good. Because he has named them according to their mode of correspondence with his own idea, his own perfection, which is inherent in his mind eternally creates them, he identifies them as imprinted and corresponding to what is in his divine mind, and then he calls them good. And the goodness of a thing is the yardstick of its perfection. How do you measure a perfect circle? Well, by its degree of correspondence to the archetypal circle. The same token, how do you measure a perfect or a good anything? It's its degree of correspondence to its creative logos in the mind of God, which is also its creative end, because all things are ordered to become fully themselves in each other. Sorry if you hear that. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm using my new microphone. Again, we're testing out various different volumes, but I don't know if you can hear that. That's the dog. Um, 
So the proclamation of the name is the revelation of the divine presence. And that's the revelation of the divine goodness because the goodness of God is also the goodness which makes all creatures good to the degree that they are such. Think about in the book of Numbers. Moses saw the form of the Lord. For most, the form was concealed in deep darkness, but Moses beheld that perfection of God's godhood. Saw the form of the Lord, which also by creative imprint is the form of all creatures. That's why he is the one who beheld the architectural blueprint for the tabernacle, which is a miniature representation of the world. And also a glorified human being. Because the tabernacle has a back, it's got legs, it's got arms, it's got ribs, it's got a head, it's got a heart. We talked about this before. Well, when it says Moses saw the form of the Lord, what's the context? Moses knew the Lord what? Face to face? Well, it says that elsewhere, but it doesn't use that phrase here. It's mouth to mouth. Moses knew the form of the Lord because he was always in conversation with him, dialogue with him. That is what creates the relationship of communion. That is what unites one subject with another subject. That is what enables one subject to be an instrument and a partner of another subject. And that's getting to the heart of the matter because that is what sonship is about in this context. The father always energizes in uh, and through his son. And I want to point out here something. This really deserves its own treatment. But I want to point out here that, you know, as the fathers say, when Adam and Eve, when they sinned, they could have been forgiven and not expelled had they repented when God asked them what they did. But they speak. They utilize that very human and exaltedly human. I don't use human as a way of saying, oh, degenerate, because of misuse of the word. That exaltedly human quality of language and speech, the very thing which makes them unique and which is meant to set them apart as the king and the queen of the world. They use that to make excuses, to lie. When they bring their sin into that sphere of existence, that is when the sin becomes mortal and they have to be exiled from the garden. Because it is by words that we exercise dominion and the eating of the tree of knowledge, had they been permitted to remain and crystallize that by participating in the tree of life, that would have enabled them to rewire the world as they saw fit. And when they use their language to miswire things, well, that was unconscionable. It would have destroyed them, would have destroyed the world. So it couldn't be permitted. So the name the son, these things are related in terms of inheritance, and we can think about this just in terms of phrase we use. Your family name. What does it mean to say that your name endures? Your family legacy. One person does a certain set of actions, accomplishes certain things. Your energies, your operations, they have an enduring effect on the world, and they continue to affect the world. You build a house. Well, the structure of that house is going to create certain situations and contexts which will affect people generations later if they continue to live in the house according to that structure in ways that you couldn't possibly have anticipated. But just as you put yourself and everything that you create, if you built that house in that way, you are continuing to shape and affect all of your descendants who continue to live in that house. In a more immediate way, uh, every person makes the choices that they do in view of the person that they become. And they make, they're the person they become in view of their childhood and their development. And whenever you see the slightest flicker of a smile or the slightest irritation, you are looking at the result of hundreds of generations of very complicated interactions between one person and another, and especially between parents and children. Parents exercise their influence down through the generations. A kindness, a slight improvement in parenting can have a ripple effect a hundred generations away that will save the world. So here's the unifying principle of the biblical story of fathers and sons. The heir of Adam is the heir of God because the son of Adam is the son of God. The inheritance of God is the inheritance of Adam because the son of Adam is the begotten of God. Okay, so that's the unifying principle which is going to stitch everything together. And this manifests in many more specific ways. Think about how King David 
asked to build God a house. And then God says, no, 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 I'm going to build you a house. I'm going to build you a family. Well, actually, David's prayer was answered by that. Because God built himself a house, and David built God a house because it was the family of David which provided for the incarnation of the word in the son of David. So if sonship is about the name, and if the name is about dominion, and if dominion, exaltation, rule over the world is what the tree of knowledge is really about, if that's what the perfection of the human being and the exaltation of the human being is all about, and if that's what theosis is all about, as after all Paul says in Philippians 3, that uh, the glory of God raised Jesus, that is the very power which enables him to subject all things to himself. So the glory of God, which immortalizes him, to use a um, uh, that word, uh, that is the very glory which enables him to exercise his rule and authority over the world. So, how does this all wrap together? Into the biblical distinction between the image and the likeness, what we are given and what we are meant to become. Well, to understand that, let's go to Genesis chapter 5. Genesis chapter 5. These are the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him the likeness of God. Here we have uh, the preposition uh, bet. Okay, so we've got the same preposition that is used to refer to the image in Genesis 126. In Irenaean terms, it is the image. So this is what Adam already possesses by virtue of his creation. Then Genesis 5 verse 2, male and female, he created them and he blessed them and he named them man. So man is the name given to the corporate organism, uh, the, human, uh, the human family. Uh, notice the name. God named them man when they were created. 5 verse 3, when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image, and he named him Seth. Now the nouns here are inverted relative to Genesis chapter 1. However, the prepositions are not. The prepositions are quite consistent with the order in Genesis 1 and with the uh, thematic or interpretive um, significance of the preposition in what I would argue Genesis chapter Two. I think I, I believe I mentioned this, but when the devil says you shall be as gods, the as there, that word which denotes the likeness, that word which denotes the promise of entrance into the heavenly court, well, that is the preposition uh, kaf. Okay? So that's really, really important because that's the preposition which is used uh, together with likeness in Genesis 1. This is what the devil promises. It's what they don't have yet. It's a kind of resemblance to God which they don't yet have, but which they want. And which, in fact, is promised to them if they would only submit to God and wait patiently. It is also used when God says man has become as one of us. Okay, so the like, the word denoting likeness here is the same preposition as God. Okay, so... Adam had lived 130 years. He fathered the son in his own likeness. This is the uh, the preposition here is bet. It's the one that's used for image in Genesis 1. And then after his image. Okay, so the uh, preposition here for after his image is kaf. And notice, it is then immediately followed by the statement uh, of his naming him Seth. Now, what is the significance of this? Adam had many other sons and daughters. Why is Seth mentioned? It's because Seth is the one who bears the family name. He's the head of the family. He's the heir to the household. He's the one through whom the purpose of Adam's creation is actually transmitted. Seth is the ancestor of Jesus, the last Adam, and also the only begotten son of God. And so the preposition, Kaf, is specifically linked, I think, to the naming, which is all about a unity of activity. It is all about one being a vice regent or partner in, uh, in rule with the other, so on and so forth. Now, notice also, we've got Adam, we've got God naming, giving man a name, Genesis 5 1. Then Adam, in relation to uh, what I would call the Aranean likeness which is associated, remember, not with the noun-translated likeness, 
because it's used with both image and likeness in terms of the noun. It's associated with the preposition cough. Preposition cough is the Irenaean likeness, okay? Preposition bet, when used with image or likeness words, is the Irenaean image. I'm sorry if that's confusing, but um, that's, that's what I think is actually the case. I don't know how to simplify that particular bit uh, more. The point here is that the name is being transmitted through the generations because the human family is a single organism. Okay? And the name which is given to the human family is a name which was given to them from God. And remember, a name always expresses something about the one who names. God says of the angel of the Lord who is the pre-incarnate son, my name is in him. He's the one through whom God acts. When uh, God renders judgment on Israel, it's the angel of the Lord who comes and appears and he uh, renders the sentence. This happens in Judges chapter, I believe it's chapter 2. Um, and it says in uh, the book of Samuel, uh, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. So the word of the Lord is actually this figure, the angel of the Lord, the one in whom the name dwells, uh, the one in whom the destiny or the activity of God runs through. And it, it, it's so interesting. If you actually, if you look at the book of Samuel, uh, it says, and this is really quite remarkable, that that the king is like the angel of God or the angel of the Lord. It specifically says angel of God. He's like this figure, the divine angel. Uh, and in what way is he like the angel of God? Well, 2 Samuel chapter 14, verse 17. My Lord, the king is like the angel of God to discern good and evil. So that is what stitches the two together. It's the only begotten Son of God who is the archetype of all goodness and thus the differentiating principle of all badness. God's activity runs through him. God's legacy, you might say, on an analogy, runs through him. And by the same token, David is the one in whom the hopes of the human family rests. And David is linked to the angel of God in this way, and the two are going to be joined together when the angel of God actually becomes incarnate as a son of David. This is what it means to exist in this relationship of likeness. For Seth to exist in a relationship of Irenaean, remember preposition cough, likeness to Adam means that he is bearing forth the family legacy, okay? But remember what we're talking about is not Seth's likeness relative to Adam, but man's likeness relative to God. Now, when we link the idea of the Irenaean likeness to the idea of naming, we recognize the immense significance of the genealogy of Genesis 5, beginning with God naming uh, man, man. The name signifies a unity or correspondence of character between the two. And remember, the man here is the one who is the plural unity. He called them man. Let us make man in our image. Why the let us here? Well, because God makes man as male and female. God uses let us when he is generating a plural unity because that is the kind of character that he has. He is one and three, and he is one in his threeness and three in his oneness. So um, that is mirrored and reflected in uh, the life of mankind. And of course, it's that plural unity which creates the possibility for there to be this kind of relationship of sonship, right? Because that's what the Trinity is all about. It's the father of the only begotten son in whom he speaks all things by the spirit. In other words, he's the logos. In other words, he is uh, the uh, archetype for uh, the human family. So this relationship between the exaltation of man, the likeness of God, that into which we grow. Remember, signified preposition cough. Don't mean to belabor that point, but it's so important to distinguish between the actual nouns um, and their relationship to the Irenaean concept and the real, I think, biblical um, uh, root of that Irenaean concept. Uh, preposition cough, that equals Irenaean likeness. That's what we are meant to grow into, but don't yet have and won't have in fullness until we are uh, glorified. Uh, the dependence of this on the uh, 
uh, name of God is a major theme in Scripture. Now, you could there, there could be um, a seven-volume set on this throughout the Bible, okay, because a name is about speech, and the whole Bible is really about speech. The liturgy is about speech. Liturgy is a dialogue. That's why there's, uh, let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. There's always a dialogue going on there. Okay, that's what is making it what it is. And Genesis begins with dialogue and God is create he's speaking to the world and he's developing the world into something which can actually talk back to him and uh, he uh, as you work through Genesis chapter 1 um, he progressively speaks in a more intimate way with the creation until he actually speaks to man and the language here is um, used in the Hebrew language when there is an expectation that the other party will or is capable of responding. Of course, you then have these dialogues within mankind. This is what makes the divine council a council. And God says things to himself. That's how we know from Genesis that the root of this let us language is Trinitarian because it is the Trinity which is the original divine council. The only reason there are these... Um, other beings in the divine councils because God has extended his counsel outwards when it's created the heavens in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. But think about how Seth placed pretty significant emphasis on Seth's role in the whole shindig. Well, in Genesis 4 verse 26, it is when Seth, to Seth also a son was born. He called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord, to call upon, to shout out or proclaim or name the name of the Lord. Various ways that this word is flexible in different directions. And all of them seem to have some relevance, I think, when you look at the use of it um, across the whole Bible. To call upon the name of the Lord is to participate in this divine creation dialogue. Because as God is the perfectly existent one, as he holds all the perfections which are intrinsic to existence, as every, every perfection that could be is in him, in one way, the name of the Lord is all that there is. There's nothing but the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is infinitely rich and deep and full. So conversation with this one name goes on forever and ever and ever. And it infinitely accelerates. But it's the name of the Lord, which is spoken to us when God makes himself known, speaks his name, tells us who he is, what he's like, what he does, what he's about. Speaks to us through the Son, because the angel of the Lord, my name is in him. And then we speak back that name. Moses, God proclaims his name to Moses. Makes himself known mouth to mouth. Moses is glorified. Well, what does Moses do? Moses intercedes. Moses is made a partner in this dialogue. Abraham. Abraham calls in the name of the Lord. Well, what do we find later? We find Abraham has now been exalted to the uh, position of intercessor. Okay, so there's many, many um, directions in which this goes throughout the scriptures. Speak to the earth and it will teach you. What the book of Job says. God brings man into his own counsel. And then man brings creation into God. What that means concretely, there's a lot of just really amazing possibilities. Don't want to get into that now, but interesting stuff that, that, that we should talk about sometime. More of a live stream thing, though. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. And that is the preface to the actual genealogy which runs from Adam to Noah. Okay, so the calling on the name of the Lord, the contextualization of the beginning of father and son from Adam onwards is in the reality that this conversation is ongoing. That there has not been a complete interruption of commerce between God and creation. That they're still talking to each other. That is the only thread which is keeping it in existence. 
that conversation is signified, expressed, and most fully realized liturgically. That is why the Nephilim, they are called men of a name. They are attempting to set up their own name over and against God. They represent a rebellion on the heavenly council. Sons of God came into the daughters of Adam. They bore children to them. This is essentially a way of utilizing the human reproductive system to engage in direct terrorism on the human race instead of having to launder it through foolish people. That's my hypothesis. I've talked about it elsewhere. I won't go into it that much now. Um, they are mighty men, conquerors, bloodthirsty, men of a name. That's what it says, Genesis 6-4. Well, Noah walked with God, or alternatively walked with the gods, which would be about the divine council, right? Uh, he, uh, the heavens open. Noah sees the court in session. The Lord saw that all things were wicked. He will blot it out. The sentence is issued. And because Noah is looking in through the open heavens, he sees the blueprint for the tabernacle of his day. Say the heavens open, it really, it just really does make a great deal of sense when you read this as kind of an apocalyptic vision. Okay, so you read this um, narrative of uh, God uh, looking at the world, seeing it and rendering a judgment. Well, when you uh, look at it in context, it looks like this is something like the vision of Daniel 7, just in terms of its tenor. Uh, this is an apocalyptic vision. The heavens are torn open. Noah sees God sitting on his throne, rendering a judgment. In this context, he sees the uh, paradigm for the temple, the paradigm for creation. He builds it after divine instruction. And then at the end of the flood, what do we have? We have Noah who has been exalted. Noah is a glorified Adam. Noah represents and exercises God's authority. So Noah is now... In certain respects, a son who's come into his inheritance. He, after all, is given the authority over life and death. That is something which belongs to God. God, having grown mankind up, entrusts it to Noah. Noah now is an instrument in God's hand for uh, cleaning out uh, the dangerous parts, the uh, cancerous parts of mankind. Now, that requires a huge amount of wisdom and prudence. I mean, there's a reason that it is um, associated with wisdom. Yes, this is a great power. And yes, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, notice also the theme of sonship, which is running through here. God said to Noah and to his sons with him. Note the way that this accentuates the whole story about the growth of man from image into likeness. Likeness, this indicates a the creation in the image. It seems to suggest, remember, because we're talking about the prepositions, that a thing exists inside the context of the larger thing. So, created in the image, that means we exist inside the creative potentiality of the logos. Well, the likeness were then shaped out and are, were given definite edges and structure um, and precision. We're like a temple which has perfect right angles. Um, the potentials are realized in irreducibly particular uh, uh, and specific ways. Well, how did this come to be? Well, it's because Noah beheld God. And was able to take the stuff of creation, restructure it so that it corresponded accurately to what he saw in heaven. And that grew him up so that he was exalted to the top of the holy mountain by the waters of the flood, the same waters which destroyed the wicked. And that is what unites God to the world. God remembered Noah as all the world is, uh, only exists in God's mind. God calls Noah and his miniature representation of the world to memory. And as that is what God remembers, that is what is perpetuated in existence. And Noah remembers God when he offers the whole creation in a representative form in the Ascension Offering. The Ascension Offering, this reestablishes this liturgical link between God and the world, which brings about its continued existence. That's a subject which we have discussed in another video uh, called When the World uh, Wakes Up. 
You will then see uh, Genesis 11, we've got a genealogy, and the head of this genealogy is Shem. You know what Shem means is name. The genealogy comes in the literary context of men trying to make a name for themselves, trying to seize an inheritance on their own terms, trying to control the world without reference to divine intention. And then we have, of course, Abram. And then Abraham. And this is where God says, I will make your name great. I will make your name great. Why? Why will God make Abram's name great? Because Abram is going to proclaim the name of the Lord. You see, as a name is the revelation, or as, as a name is the expression of the namer, and as man is a name which goes back to God, Genesis 5 1, and as we are all heirs of that man, we are all by implication heirs of God. That's why Luke's gospel, its genealogy traces back to Adam. The son of Adam, the son of God, is rooted in Genesis 5, 1 to 2. If man is created in the likeness of God, then Seth is the likeness of Adam. Well, it looks like likeness means um, sonship. So the exaltation and redemption of the human family is also the exaltation of the divine name because the divine name is internal, actually, to the structure and wiring of the human being. And it's only by the divine name that God creates things. Right? So God shapes things as being something very specific. How? Because he endows it with a name. It's appropriate goodness, that standard of perfection. Well, what do you know? Abram is said to be calling out or proclaiming the name of the Lord. He's a minister. Uh, a Abram is an evangelist, as are all the patriarchs. That's why you see so many Gentiles with them. To your offspring, I will give this land. But Abram adopts a great deal into his family. And that's why it actually refers to many souls that Abram made in Haran. That's the word, bara. Made. He created them in Haran. How? By the name of the Lord. Abram spoke that name which God had given him. And by that name, he recreated people. And those people became the root, which became the great family um, which possessed the land in the days of Joshua. So... Uh, you know, it's a, this is a larger, more kind of broad video than I really wanted it to be. Um, I was hoping to, to be able to keep it a little more specific. Maybe I will actually make something very kind of succinct at some point. But I wanted to give just kind of a, 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 an illustration of um, the way in which the Irenaean and really the, the Orthodox, the patristic um, doctrine of the distinction between the image and the likeness can be rooted and grounded in the scriptures um, and how... This is a really interesting one for me because um, this is one of those questions which just seemed to me for so long I was making no progress on it. Um, you know, I, I really wasn't having any kind of, there was no doubts or anything because I, because, hold on. but it was a little frustrating that there was no apparent progress. Then I realized, oh wait, I was looking at it from the wrong perspective. I was, I kept trying to find some kind of connection between the um, theology of image and likeness in Irenaeus and the actual nouns translated image and likeness. But I was asking the wrong question. It was a very simple mistake. And yet the mistake was sufficiently subtle that it took me something like 10 years to actually ask the right question. The moment I did, and I started you know, looking up, well, where do these these uh, words, where do these prepositions actually show up? What patterns do they show up? I mean, things crystallize very, very quickly. So it's kind of a, an interesting case study of the way I think that uh, scripture can be read fruitfully. Uh, so I hope you got something out of this video. Um, by God's will, on Wednesday, I will be uh, um, doing a live stream. I meant to announce this at the beginning. It, I don't know if anyone is even still listening, but I'm actually doing a debate with Shabir Ali on uh, uh, January 24th, 9 p.m., doing a, uh, a conversation on Calvinism with Sam Shamoon a couple days before that. Um, I'll announce that at the beginning of my live stream or something. Um, but uh, hey, if you're still here, congratulations. And blah, blah, pa Patreon, Patreon. Um, if you're interested in supporting this content, please consider becoming a patron. It's very helpful and so forth. Um, anyway, thanks guys.